Good morning and welcome to the third Sunday of Advent. I'm Steve Finlan on behalf of the First Church. Welcome everybody who takes the time to watch these reduced versions of our Sunday service. I'll bring you a sermon, a song, and a prayer. The song from our hymnal is number 133, Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming. The sermon is called, What is Sown? And it's based on verses from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. May God give his blessing to my interpretation today. Welcome to the Sunday of Joy, the third Sunday of Advent. I hope all of you receive joy today and then share your joy with others. For our scripture, we have one of the most important and most neglected passages in the Bible, one that Jesus used to introduce his own ministry, drawn probably by the reference to being anointed, being sent to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to proclaim liberty to the captives. He would have recognized this as sounding like what his new ministry was already starting to look like. Looking at the second half of today's reading, you'll notice that the voice changes. In verse 8, the Lord speaks, talking about his hatred of robbery and wrongdoing, and promising to bring an everlasting covenant. In verses 10 and 11, the human narrator speaks, starting with the joy that he has experienced being clothed with the garments of salvation, and culminating with the extraordinary positive message that God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is a promise of spiritual growth and righteousness for the whole human race. This is an underrated and important joyful promise. It goes against the more well-known end-of-the-world scenarios of tribulation and judgment that we usually hear about. Obviously, it will not be a simple or easy path to the destination of a praised-filled world. We will have to overcome things that currently blight the human race. Robbery, lust for power, nationalism, war, bigotry, and religious intolerance. These are like traps in which people get caught. These will fade away as we grow in the path that Jesus teaches. Jesus brings a way out of each one of these traps. He proclaims release to the captives of religious bigotry if they become open to foreigners as Jesus was open to Romans, Samaritans, Canaanites, and Greeks. Jesus can provide spiritual insight to those who are blinded by prejudice and hate, but they have to let their hearts be broken and recognize how toxic their prior ways were. They have to be humble enough to reflect upon their condition and admit their spiritual need. Need. That's what I see in the wonderful line from the Leonard Cohen song, Suzanne, that says, Only drowning men could see him. Actually, let's look at the whole setting. It goes, 
Jesus was a sailor when he walked upon the water, and he spent a long time watching from his lonely wooden tower. And when he knew for certain only drowning men could see him, he said all men will be sailors then until the sea shall free them. A great Jesus passage, and it comes from a Jewish songwriter. It's about needy people turning to the one who can save them in their deepest need and then get them to join with him, which is pictured as becoming a sailor. I like the image of Jesus as a sailor rescuing drowning people. Now let's return to the original image, that of God causing a garden to grow abundantly. Growing plants has always been a good metaphor for the growing spiritual character of believers. All parents know about growth as a constant and miraculous reality with their children. They grow like weeds, quickly and somewhat wildly. We also need to grow intellectually and emotionally, to become deeper in our thinking and more empathetic in our feeling. We have this life ahead of us. We have the promise and the mandate of growth. We are the children of God, and children grow. Trust that God is the father of our growth, the initiator, supporter, and consummator of our growth and the destination of our growth. I think God is the source of our mind, not of every thought in our minds, but of the mind itself with its ability to reflect and choose. When we make some spiritually significant choices, we can start to see signs of God's guidance. Maybe you start to encounter persons who will be significant in your life, who reinforce a life-affirming direction that you are taking. The support you feel from some of your friends is probably plugged into God's support for you. And then God becomes our destination. We start thinking about where we are ultimately headed and about how God will fulfill his purpose for us will complete the good work he has begun in us. We will grow into wiser, stronger, more loving children of God. And eventually the whole world will get on track, although we are far from it now. There was a big achiever named Brad Strait who worked two jobs, owned his own construction company, and worked part-time as a paramedic. He was always achieving wins in his life, he says. He liked volunteering at his church and his friends there started telling him he would make a good minister. He went ahead and went to seminary, then university, while still working his other two jobs. Finally, he quit those jobs and became a pastor. He realized that he had felt hollow inside and only now did he feel free. Only now has he lost the need to be an overachiever with many material wins in his life. He has become less brash, more authentic, more comfortable in his own skin, more aware that only God and not achievements can fill the empty space in his heart. It is a story of personal growth and gradual humbling. I want to finish with another mention of the promise of Isaiah 61. Eventually God will cause everything that is sown in the garden to spring up and will cause righteousness and praise to sprout before all the nations. The human race will eventually become a beautiful garden. In the meantime, we have to work to preserve civilization against the forces of barbarism. We have to resist robbery and wrongdoing. We have to avoid the prisons of religious bigotry and narrow-minded nationalism. We have to become more sure about what spiritual values really are so that we can dedicate ourselves to what is right and good and beautiful. The wins we need are victories over egotism, fear, and the avoidance of the inward issues of our lives. If you fear and if you hate, then you have inward issues that you're not facing. Face them with Jesus' help. I hope you find freedom in devotion, love, and service. God will make your garden bloom. I'm going to sing Lo How a Rose Air Blooming 
the first verse I'm going to sing the soprano, that is the melody, and the second and third verses I'm going to sing the tenor line. Lo, how a rose a blooming from tender stem hath sprung of Jesse's lineage coming as men of old have sung it came a blossom bright amid the cold of winter when half spent was the night Isaiah twas foretold it the rose I have in mind with Mary we behold it the virgin mother kind it came a blossom bright she bore to men a savior when half spent was the night O oh, flower whose fragrance tender with sweetness fills the air dispel in glorious splendor the darkness everywhere to man yet very God from sin and death now save us and share our every load. Yes, a wonderful melody in the tenor or in the soprano. I don't know about the alto and, and bass. I haven't sung those. But we give thanks for the incarnation of the Word of God in a human life. That's what Advent's all about, anticipating that incarnation. And so let us say a prayer for people near and far. Jesus, we pray in your name for people in our congregation and who are near and far. We pray for Carol and Mike. We pray for Warren and Winnie. We pray for Lucy. We pray also for Ryan. Bless him and help him in all his days. Help us, Jesus, to become better disciples, better listeners and hearers and receivers of your values so that we can blossom in the garden of life that you have planted here. Help us to overcome evil in our own lives and to be witnesses to goodness where we can. We pray for peace on earth. Help the suffering people of Ukraine and Syria and Turkey and Myanmar and suffering people all over the world, including the homeless during this winter season. And we say the prayer that you taught us when you said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yours is the living example of life, and so we follow your example in ways of loving and forgiving and being good listeners. Help us, Jesus, to be better disciples. In your name, amen. <laughs>